Hey, Jeff, I have some really good news today. Oh, great. Yeah, the good news is it's another day of us on podcasts. Hey, and we're talking about the good news. Yeah, Paul shares the good news. We're kicking off a uh, talk about the Book of Romans. Yep. So he's Chris and I'm Jeff and we're the Bible Guys. So, Jeff, today we are handed a segment that we have not done actually in quite a while Yeah, called This or That. These are fun. Yeah, they are fun because it's all it is is just uh, your opinions and your choices. And we have plenty of those. Yes, of course. <laughs> so it just it says this or that. Which one would you rather either do, have, or be? Okay. So here's the first one. Okay, here we go. Would you rather have unlimited tacos or unlimited ice cream? No, no brainer. Unlimited tacos. Yeah. Uh, so for me, what it's about actually— you? well. It's the wrong choice, but it's unlimited ice cream. Really? Yeah, I love love tacos, like the universe. The uh-huh. universe loves tacos. Sure, sure, right. Uh, however, uh, ice cream is the one thing that is my downfall. Wow. Like, I could eat ice cream all the time. Wow. Okay. All the time. Yeah. And there's I, so many choices, just like tacos. I, I, I love ice cream, but I have, like, limited, like, I, I can go once a month with ice cream, and I'm perfectly fine. Ooh. Like like a taste of ice cream. Oh, I could do ice cream. If it, if it wasn't like the thing that is mm-hmm. super sugary and fat, mm-hmm. I could probably drink a shake a day. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, see, you have a shake problem. You have an ice cream problem, <laughs> it sounds like. Yeah. Now, I like a good gelato, like a nice creamy chocolate gelato. Oh. I love that. All right, question number two. Okay. Would you rather wear a tux to work every day or have to wear pajamas to work every day? Oh, uh uh, tux. I'd rather wear a tux to, to work every day rather than pajamas. You are insane. Really? Why? Why would you be formal? Well, you look so fancy. Well, who cares about how you look? Well, you dress for success. Uh, how about dress for comfort? <laughs> I, you know what? The older <laughs> I get, and, but with the rest of the world too, yeah. the older we get, the more we realize that comfort becomes the priority. Right, right. Right. So, you know, I think that's the reason why people, the older you get, it's just, it's just all about well, they cushiony go from soft. All the other shoes to new balance. Right. 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 <laughs> all the men start finding like stretchy pants. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right, yeah. Right, yeah. Right. Comfort. Well, I can see that. Yeah. So let me ask you a question. When you get home from work and let's just say you're in jeans and a button down shirt, mm-hmm. do you not immediately change into something more comfortable? No. Nothing. No, never. Do you have a set of pajamas? No, not a whole set. Do you realize how many sets of pajamas I have? Oh, I'd imagine a bunch. I would say 30. What? Yeah. You collect pajamas? No, it's just what I have. Well, you have to. 30 of anything seems like a collection to me. I wear pajamas every day. Wow. Yeah. So, no. I'm sorry. That's hilarious. Wow. Okay. I think you That sounds sophisticated, though. I think you're in the minority. Like, are you talking pajamas that button up and a collar and the whole nine yards? Like, Mr. Cleaver? Uh, Well, it's probably not what you're thinking. It's not like silk proper pajama set Oh, because i'm envisioning you now like in a smoking jacket at night <laughs> sitting in dim light and you're you know you, you do fi- realize, finally paneled you do realize the majority of guys pajamas are just the bottoms and then you just wear a t-shirt with it oh, okay that's the popular thing yeah. okay but, well but, I, I have a pair of pajama bottoms i guess okay all right yeah well i, I do have several sets though okay yeah. <laughs> i do well apparently 30 <laughs> Um, yeah, well, I mean, there's a lot. Okay. Okay. How about this? Well, that's uh, amazing. Sorry. We spent so much time on that. I'm just blown away. That's all right. Mm-hmm. Uh, would you rather watch all your movies and TV shows in half speed or double speed? Oh, double speed. Yeah. No, no, totally. no brainer. Yeah. 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 Who totally. would want to go half speed? Yeah. Yeah. Whoa, I don't know. You're a movie buff. Maybe you'd enjoy it twice as much. It took twice <laughs> <Maybe>. as long. <laughs> it reminds me of, uh, it reminds me of, um, what's that one, uh, show with the Fox in the, in the sloth. And the sloth is there oh, at, the, at the DMV. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah <laughs> That's yeah, hilarious. Yeah, yeah. Okay, how about this? Number four. Uh, would you rather have a burnt tongue or, or uh, for a week or have a brain freeze for a week? Oh, neither. Neither. Can I Can I vote neither on that one? Yeah, no doubt. Yeah. Oh, man. If, I, you, if you have to choose one, what would you choose? I'd have to, I'd have to go with the burnt tongue because mm. I could deal with it. But a brain freeze is like, it's like debit. De- Debilitating. Debil- what, are, what, what am I saying? <laughs> did to say? you just have a brain freeze? Yeah, I just debilitating did. is the right word. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so it, it really is, right? Yeah, you can't do anything. Oh, yeah. With a burnt yeah. tongue, it's just really a sore. bad brain freeze. I mean, you got to turn the lights off in the room kind of thing. Yeah. Just, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Debilitating. Yes. And then number five, uh, would you rather, oh my goodness, would you rather win every game you play or lose every game you play? Oh, win. Win every, 
So winning is fun and everything else is not winning. Right. 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 That, that's yeah, how it I don't works. know why anybody would choose losing. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I love to lose. Losing is the best. Right. <laughs> to which that's I somebody say, always taught to be a good loser. Well, I was be just a good loser or just a loser. Yeah. I, I remember <laughs> one of my, one of my coaches when I was a kid told us to be good losers, right? Cause we were all mad after losing a game. We yeah. had, I was in a baseball team and we went mostly undefeated deep into the season. We were still undefeated and we yeah. lost a game. We shouldn't lose. So we were kind of mad. One of the kids threw a bat. Um, you know, we were all angry, hitting the fence, whatever. And just bad attitudes is our first loss. The coach comes in, gives us this whole speech about being a good loser. Yeah. On the way home, my dad said, Jeff, you know that I, I uh, look up to your coach. I think your coach is a good coach. My dad always would encourage me to look up to my coaches. I see. Yes. He said, so I just want to clarify something. We never want to be good losers. We want to be gracious losers. Right. You never want to get good at losing. Right. Just be gracious when you do. <laughs> and he said, there's a difference. He said, sometimes, I know it sounds like semantics, but words matter. <laughs> right, right. That's I, true. I don't wanna, what, what are you good at? I'm good at losing. You right, don't want that. Right. Right? You want to be a funny. winner, man. So, well, today. A lot of people don't like winning or losing. A lot of people don't. It feels like a measurement thing. It feels like a. Really? Right? Oh, yeah, yeah. They, they just feel like everybody should just enjoy participating. Oh, like trophies. I guess. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah blech. <laughs> Yeah, we're a couple of old guys. We like winning. So, yeah. um, well, today we actually are. You know, just to remind everybody, we're going through the Book of Acts, mm -hmm. and chronologically, since Paul wrote almost new half half the New Testament, uh, what we're doing is we're sort of breaking chronologically from the Book of Acts, and, and we're sort of going to the letters that uh, that he has written. Well, today, uh, actually, last podcast we just finished up Second Corinthians, right? right? Right. He was on his third is on his third missionary journey. Mm -hmm. And, and today is going to take a surprising jump directly from 2 Corinthians to Romans. Well, uh, I don't think we're going to put it on the screen, but there is two halves of a verse that says, then he traveled down to Greece where he straight, stayed for, for three, three months. months. Right. That's in the book of Acts. And then we're moving on. During that time, the three months that he was in, in Greece, he wrote the book of Romans, yeah. as far as we know. And, and this is interesting, too, because, uh, number one, Romans doesn't uh, read like a typical letter. Yeah. And then, number two, this is actually a church that he has never been to. Right. That's why. That's why I think the, the other ones are so personal. Yeah. And this one's pretty academic. Yeah. And because yeah. Uh, th this church most likely was started by the Jews that uh, came up from uh, uh, Acts chapter 2, the yeah, Pentecost. Pentecost. And, um, and actually, uh, uh, it was mostly Jewish, although there were some, you know, Greeks in, in the church. And Paul was writing to introduce himself. He was writing to, in hopes to visit them, which he did mm -hmm. eventually. Uh, uh, this was written around 57 uh, uh, A.D., according to my little notes over here on my Life Application Study Bible. And uh, and about three years later, after this letter of introduction, he actually gets to visit them. Okay, good. So we're just going to pick up, and Paul wastes no time. Yep. Within just a few verses, he gets into some really big stuff. And from there on, this is a heavy-hitting book, one of the most theological books in the Bible, really defining for us what the meaning of what we talk about as the gospel, what that is. He kind of provides the framework of it. But he also deals with a lot of other social issues and uh, um, behavioral issues. So this is, this is a hard-hitting book. Mm -hmm. The other ones were correction. Stop doing this. Stop doing this. Um, this book is more just emphatic statements of this is what real Christianity is, mm. right? So mm -hmm. no corrections in here, just making statements. All right, <clears throat> so let's jump in. We're reading from the New Living Translation, if you're following along, Romans chapter 1. And we'll read through, what, verse 18? 17. 17. Mm -hmm. This letter is from Paul, a slave of Christ Jesus, chose, chosen by God to be an apostle and sent out to preach his good news. God promised this good news long ago through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. The good news is about his son. And in his earthly life, he was born into King David's family line, and he was shown to be the Son of God when he was raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. He is Jesus Christ, our Lord. Through Christ, God has given us the privilege and authority as apostles to tell Gentiles everywhere what God has done for them, so that they will believe and obey him, bringing glory to his name. And you are included among those Gentiles who have been called to belong to Jesus Christ. I am writing to all of you in Rome who are loved by God and are called to be his own holy people. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. Let me say first that I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith in him is being talked about all over the world. God knows how often I pray for you. Day and night I bring you and your needs in prayer to God. 
whom I serve with all my heart by spreading the good news about his son. One of the things I always pray for is the opportunity, God willing, to come at last to see you. For I long to visit you so I can bring you some spiritual gift that will help you grow strong in the Lord. When we get together, I want to encourage you in your faith, but I also want to be encouraged by yours. I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, that I planned many times to visit you, but I was prevented until now. I want to work among you and see spiritual fruit just as I have seen among other Gentiles, for I have a great sense of obligation to people in both the civilized world and the rest of the world, to the educated and uneducated alike. So I am eager to come to you in Rome, too, to preach the good news, for I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Gentile. This good news tells us how God makes us right in his sight. This is accomplished from start to finish by faith. As the scriptures say, it is through faith that a righteous person has life. Hmm. You know what always cracks me up is uh, that verse that says, the Jew first, <laughs> mm-hmm. and then mm-hmm. the Gentile. Yeah, yeah. yeah but uh, we have to understand that he's not saying that the, the Jewish person has priority of salvation over, over another person. <clears throat> right. What he's saying is, is that uh, in the Old Testament, that the Jewish people were God's chosen people. Right. And actually, God was actually associated with the Jewish people. Um, and then actually, when people talked about God, it was the God of the Jewish people, right. right? Or God of Israel. Right. Well, Jesus was the Jewish Messiah. Right. So Jesus came to the Jews and it emanated from, the idea of Christianity emanated from the Jewish religion. Right. I think that that's what it's talking about. It, it came to them first, but now it's spreading everywhere. That, right. That's what he's talking about. But, yeah. uh, as a matter of fact, some translations would say in uh, verse 14, where it talks about you know, in the civilized world and the rest of the world, he's saying also to the Greeks and the barbarians is, is what it was saying. So, you know, you got to remember in this time in the Western world, so this is everything maybe on the, the West end of the Silk Road all the way to Spain, that whole region up into Gaul, which would be, you know, modern day France and Germany now, and maybe even pushing towards, uh, by this point, not quite pushed towards, uh, I don't think towards Germany or towards England yet. But it's, it's most of the Mediterranean, that whole thing. To them, that was the whole world. They thought when you went past um, the Rock of Gibraltar out into the Atlantic Ocean, somewhere out there, you just fell off the planet, right? That's what they thought. <laughs> so they thought that they had dominated almost the whole world. And on the edges of the rest of the world were those barbarians. So it's pretty much Romans, Greeks, some Africans along the bottom uh, of the Mediterranean, and then those barbarians to the north. And so what he's saying is basically, in his mind, it's available to everybody. That's what he's talking about. But it's, it's kind of a funny way for him to say it that way, right? Mm. So he's just trying to include all the peoples. Well, you know, you said something last night at dinner. We were at dinner, had a meeting, and, and you were explaining that uh, when the Great Commission was given, at the time, there was a half of a billion people on the planet Earth. That's right. So think about that just yeah. in terms of population. Yeah, that's according to the, uh, I think it's a UN uh, census thing and then also the U.S. Census Bureau they both kind of combined all of their projected research and, and go back. We didn't cross a billion people on the planet until about the same time that the um, uh, printing press was invented in the 1500s. Wow. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, that's So until amazing. then, that first 1,500 years of Christianity, it was roughly a billion, uh, half a billion people. Wow. Isn't that amazing? And now we have uh, 27 billion people on the no, planet? No, no, no. We, we have 8, 8 billion uh, <laughs> here in January of 2023. They're saying there's 8 billion we just crossed that line, by the way, just just yes. recently. So some people are saying we crossed eight billion in November. Others are saying it's going to happen here in January. But right here, it's eight billion, and by you, 2050 you know, it will be ten billion. Yes, 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 yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. But uh, by 2050, it'll be ten billion people on the planet. So yeah. our responsibility with the good news of the gospel is going to be in our lifetime, if we live to 2050, is going to be 20 times the scale of Paul's responsibility with the gospel. Well. And Paul was willing to risk everything to go tell everybody. And there's only half a billion people on the total, a whole planet. Mm. And he only didn't, he only knew about maybe half of them. Right. Right. And here you and I are sitting here and all of our listeners that are Christians with responsibility reaching 10 billion people in our lifetime. God's mandate hasn't changed. The responsibility is much greater, but he's also given us unbelievable resources Paul couldn't have imagined back then. Right. He couldn't imagine. I'm, I'm going to, on Saturday, I'm For getting... For instance, this podcast. Yeah, yeah. The ability to just to speak literally around the world. We're, we, we're what, in 80-something countries on the podcast or whatever, and uh, ev- almost every state in the union, just by talking, and people can choose to tune in. The ability to communicate like that uh, through the internet. Uh, I'm going to get on an airplane on Saturday. I'm flying to Egypt, and then after Egypt, I'm flying on to India. And the idea that 
I'll be in Egypt in less than a day. Less mm-hmm. than 24 hours I can be in Egypt, right? That's unbelievable. Yep. Paul couldn't, it would take him months. months. And we can do it in 24 hours. And so uh, with this great responsibility, God's also given us great uh, uh, opportunity and ability. And yeah. so this idea of him saying, hey, I'm planning. He, basically, this letter is an introduction to himself saying, I want to come and visit you. And uh, here's why I think we're going to have a meaningful ministry together. Yeah. And and uh, and he definitely talks about Jesus here, introducing Jesus as mm-hmm. the foundation. And and, uh, and as he speaks about Jesus, he talks about uh, the verse that stuck out to me was he said he was born into King David's family line. Right. And he was shown to be the son of God when he was raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. He is Jesus Christ, our Lord. And, uh, and so I, that immediately thought, made me think of the two genealogies in the Gospels. Yeah. So, you know, if, when you're reading the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, which all talk about the story of Jesus, in Matthew, there's a genealogy, and it was written, um, uh, to, to, uh, it was written from Abraham, right? Yeah. Abraham to Joseph. And really, he was writing to a Jewish audience and, and, and establishing the, the, the claim that Joseph had through David, King David. And then the other genealogy is in a couple chapters into the book of Luke, and it actually goes backwards from Joseph all the way to uh, Adam mm-hmm. for Adam, and of course through David, of course, right? right? right. And so it's just you know just sort of showing the uh, you know the humanity of it, and 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 just the you know again proving that he's from King David. Yeah, both of them showing that that both Mary and Joseph were in the royal lineage of King David. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. It's pretty incredible. So. This idea then, you know, Paul is starting off in introducing himself to strangers, but they're not strangers. They're godly people who have a famous reputation for godly people. He just hasn't met them yet. And so he's reminding them that the commonality for all Christians is not a political affinity. Uh, The commonality of all Christians is not that we have the exact same social views or anything. The commonality for all Christians is that Jesus Christ uh, is the son of God and he rose from the dead for salvation. Yeah. Right. Of all humanity. That, that's the common thing. And so we can have common fellowship with others that are different from us in Christ. And that's what he's trying to point out. You know, I, I remember the first time I took a massive missions trip over to Africa and I realized that as different as that culture is and those people are, they, to me, I thought, man, this is going to be so different. Yeah. And then I realized how alike we are. Uh, you know, there's a lot of, you know, things that we share, you know, family traits and right. loving, loving our kids. Sure. and you know, so so it's it's like wow, these these guys are really not that much different. But honestly, it was the commonality of Jesus. It was like it was like we they accepted me and I accepted them, and just we felt immediately like we are brothers in Christ right. or sisters in Christ. Yep. So it was just it was really interesting to me how I felt what you just said. Mm-hmm. I felt it, yeah, I have and to. I actually thought like, whoa, that is amazing. That's an amazing feeling. Yeah. Uh, so you know, there's times when I've gone into places where normally. Uh, it might it might be dangerous um, or for outsiders or it would be extremely uncomfortable, but immediately those walls are torn down because of our commonality in Christ. Mm. Right. And this is uh, the universal, I believe, universal appeal of Jesus is that um, in Galatians, Paul says that there's no more uh, Jew or Gentile. There's no more slave or free. There's no more male or female. We're all one in Christ. And this is kind of what he's appealing to, to the Romans here. Now, uh, we know that the gospel came to Rome through those earliest Christians out of the Acts chapter 2. That, that's the tradition. But he's clearly referring here that it looks like the majority of them now are Gentiles. Because mm-hmm. in verse 8, or verse 6, he says, and you're included among those Gentiles who've been called to belong to Christ. So it seems like this is a majority Gentile. So basically, um, you know, uh, Romans, these are Romans. And um, uh, so he's appealing to them from that standpoint. Also, the way he writes this book is very logical, right? It's not emotional or philosophical. He starts at A and goes to Z is pretty much how he writes this book. And um, that would appeal to Romans in a way that maybe it wouldn't have appealed to some of the people from Syria or Turkey that he was writing to before. So he adapts his style a little bit to who he's writing to. They're also going to be much more highly educated in the power center of the entire universe at that time, mm. um, they're going to be more educated. And so he, he comes at it from that standpoint, which is really impressive that he can choose to be who his listeners need him to be. He's not a chameleon like he's faking it. 
It's just that he has the ability to simplify things when he needs to simplify it, or he has the ability in this book to step up to the plate and go, all right, let me lay it out there on a you know pretty advanced level, and yeah. I, I know you guys can keep up. Yeah, and Paul had the unique privilege of actually being a Pharisee and a Roman citizen. That's right. So uh, being a Roman citizen, you know, he has credibility right from the start. And, um, and when he's writing, uh, he's actually, you know, sort of introducing the fact that, you know, God is, is not just for the Jewish people, for the Gentiles. And the reason why is because we have to understand and keep in mind that uh, the reason why he writes this is he's setting the stage because the word apostle, we call him the apostle Paul. Mm -hmm. The word apostle means one who is sent, right? And so he's actually given a mission by God to reach specifically those people who are non-Jewish. Right. So that, that's the definition of the word Gentile. So just keeping in mind that when he's writing about Jews and Gentiles, he is the, he is the leading expert in the world about, right. about telling everybody, hey, listen, Jesus died on the cross, and his gospel, his good news, is not just for the Jewish people anymore. Right. It's for everybody, uh, barbarians, pagans, yeah. Yeah, yeah. right, for, you know, Gentiles, anybody. And so it, it, I, I love the fact that he's setting the stage that way and everything who he is, everything about who he is supports this letter. So what we do, what we see is at the very beginning, his very first sentence is shocking. I'm a slave of Christ mm -hmm. for, for a Roman citizen to embrace the idea of being a slave. What he's doing mm -hmm. is he's recognizing Jesus bought me with his blood and now I serve him unquestionably. So he starts off very humble, but by the end of this first 17 verses, he's saying, but I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it's the power of God to salvation. And uh, so then that sets the stage, humble serving. I want to humbly serve you, but we're not ashamed of this power of God that brings us to salvation. It's available to everybody through faith. And the whole rest of the book unpacks that idea. Yeah. And what a great verse to memorize. Uh, Romans 1 16, for I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ, for it is the power of God at work saving everyone who believes. Yeah. And so it's just a, it's just a great reminder that uh, when it comes down to, you know, bringing up conversations about God or talking about your faith, even though that a lot of people like to keep it private, um, you know, we're supposed to not be ashamed. Uh, you know, it's interesting why people want to keep their faith private because, you know, sometimes the church has gotten a bad rap over the years mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and we deserve most of that bad rap. Uh, but for the majority for the majority of people, they don't have a bad church experience. But I think that a lot of us in this culture, we listen to culture and cultures like keep your religion private, keep your faith private, you know, and that's sort of, that's sort of the narrative, right? Mm -hmm. But, but, you know, as long as you're doing it, you know, not with, you know, spiritual manipulation, <laughs> you know, or, or being, you know, uh, all the, all those different negative things, you know, just, just be not ashamed of your faith, share your faith, right. be proud that you believe in God and his son, Jesus Christ. And tell people, without a doubt, that's the reason for your happiness, your joy, and everything else. The only power to save people from their sins and to change their lives is the power of God unto salvation. Yeah. And so that comes from the fact that we're not, we, we, that's why we shouldn't be ashamed of right. this good news. So, Well, well that, it looks like we're right at that time, so yeah. we're excited to pick up uh, tomorrow, and we'll hopefully see you then on The Bible Guys.